<laughs> we say in Italian, uh, gabish, right, Chris? <laughs> well, if you have your Bibles there, I hope you do, turn to, just to take a look at John chapter 15, uh, where our brother just read from a minute ago. And we have uh, just sort of taken a break. Um, brother Jeff there from Tom's River, New Jersey, right? Is it not Tom's River, the mailing address? We're actually in what? Lakehurst, a little west of Tom's River. He's like five minutes from my mother, where my mother lives. And she lives in the Holiday City, right off of Route 37 there. She shops at the shop right over there. I guess you guys go to shop right too? My favorite store. <laughs> I just can't get there anymore. So if you go to ShopRite and you see that fresh mozzarella cheese, just think of me and ship me some, all right? Uh, John chapter 15, verse 12. We're having friend day, three weeks from today already. Now, you know, in the bulletin, Brother John told it, there's a, there's a thing, it's that they, when you invite somebody, hand them that, like as an invitation, all right? And if you need more, do they have more on the back table? I don't know, but we should print more of those, Lisa, if we can. Let me know if Brother John can do it or I can do it. How many of you have already, if you did, raise your hand. If you didn't, don't feel bad. We still have three weeks, right? But did you invite anybody yet? Did anybody do that yet? One, two, three, four, five. Good. Hey, very good. So everybody, at least we want to have everybody to bring one person. If you do that, that means on that day, we would double our attendance. Now I say, well, all you care about is having people in here? Yes. <laughs> There's a book in the Bible called Numbers, you know. Uh, numbers is very important. <laughs> What we would like to do is have people come to church. We're going to have a Bible message. I promise I'm not going to preach for three hours, you know. We're going to have a short message, uh, probably full of the gospel in that message on that day for the people that are here. Those of you that are here to save, just bear with me, all right? We know you're already saved, but this is for the visitors that day. We'll have a, a little fellowship afterward, a potluck dinner, and then they'll be on their way. So try to see... This morning, I think we might have 20 or 30, 25, 30 people. I'd like to see 60 to 75 people. Is that hard to do? If everybody brings one, it's very easy to do. If you invite more than, I'd recommend you invite, to get one person, I think you have to invite five or 10. <laughs> now this person, they'll promise to come and they'll, I'll be there. And then when Sunday comes and they're not here, don't get upset, it happens. But at least if you invite more than one, the chances are good that you might have one come. And that's what Friend Day is about, getting people under the sound of the gospel. Because why? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. That's what we want. Uh, that's what we're called to do. We don't want to say, well, Pat Bethel on the back. Oh, guess what? We had 60 in church. We're here so that these people might hear the Word of God and turn to Christ. That's what it's all about, right? Uh, we started last week on Friend Day messages instead of what we've been doing, 2 Corinthians, right? So, Again, bear with me until October. We'll be back in 2 Corinthians. But I want you to see God's friendship, His friendship. We sung songs about it this morning that Brother John picked, about what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. I mean, no other friend like that, and especially when Jesus said that He gave His life for His friends. I mean, unbelievable. The word we talked about last week, the original language of the Bible in the New Testament was Greek, Right? Who knows what the word for friend was there? It comes from the word with the cream cheese. Uh, <laughs> Philadelphia. The word philos is actually the word, which means a friend, an acquaintance. And uh, this is the word Jesus in John 15 uses it three times here in those, in those few verses. It says, greater love has no man than this. What a love is right, that a man lays down his life for his friends. Now, we have friends. I have some very good friends. I was talking to Terry last night about uh, friends of mine in New Jersey that we, we would get together. Usually we'd go out to eat. Come on. What are you supposed to do with your friends? Sit there and play Pinochle, you know, or play Scrabble? No, we go out and eat. That's what real friends do. And we would go out. Uh, I knew all the hot spots, Brother Jeff. I said to Brother Jeff, do you want to go out and have lunch today? And he goes, I, I don't know anything around here. I said, I know about most of the things. Terry knows more than I do. But it's not going to be like New Jersey. I just want to let you know. <laughs> I have to make my own meatballs for you to have a good meatball, but there are good places here. But friends, is a friend going to go out to dinner with you? Yes. Will a friend maybe loan you money and you pay him back? Uh, maybe. Is a friend going to die for you? Uh, probably not. 
Now, you may uh, know that they have security guards, you know, and special secret service for the president. They may take a bullet. I mean, they get paid very well for that, and I'm sure they're, uh, if they compensated, that, that, that's what they do. That's their job. But uh, to do that for a friend, uh, most people won't do that. Would you do something for a, a parent? If my mom was in harm's way, would I risk my life for my mother? Yes. What, would you do it for a good friend? Mm, I don't know about that. What about Jesus said? He's talking about himself here. He laid his life down. Not when we were friends with God. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, God demonstrated, showed, commended his love toward us while we were yet friends? No. While we were yet what? Sinners. Christ died for us. The Bible talks about us being at enmity. We were, we were really enemies of God before we got saved, whether we knew it or not. If you asked me before I get saved if I loved the Lord, I would have said yes. Are you a Christian? Yes. Was I? No. <laughs> and so while we were yet sinners, what a friend. What a friend It's true we have in Jesus. I'm going to look at five sayings real quick. I have about 12 minutes to be done by 11. I'm going to try my best, all right? Five human sayings. I think we have it. Do you have it in the bulletin, my outline, Brother Fran? Is it in there, Francis? Good. Go by my outline if you can. You're going to maybe put little things in there. We're going to see what m people say. They have statements, you know, blood is thicker than water. You've heard some of these things. Compared to what God says and his friendship. Number one is, people say this, friends know all about each other so well. We know every intimate little detail about a person. Or do we really? It's true we know a lot about our friends. If you say you have a best friend, what do they call that, BFF or something like that? I used to think that was like a bad word or something. He's my BFF. What does that mean? What does that mean anyway? Best friends forever. Oh, isn't that cute? So we have our best friends forever, and they, they know details about us. I have guys I went to school with, played high school football, college football. So they, my name is Kuzo, but in Italian they say Kuazzo. Like C-U-O, the Atzo, the Z is like, anyway, they used to call me Quasimodo. I shouldn't even say that here, because I know Brother Kenny now, that's what he's going to call me for the rest of my life. So one time they had the video on Monday, we had the football game Saturday in college. Monday we watched the film. You see all the mistakes you make and the good things that you do, but the coach especially keeps running over and over. Let's run that back of Kuzo getting blocked out of the screen here, something like that, you know. But uh, one time I was going to sack the quarterback. I played defense. The quarterback's got the ball. He's about to throw. I'm supposed to sack him, you know, tackle him before he throws it. And I'm over there chasing him. And the coach always tells you, if you can't get the quarterback, at least have your hands up so he has to throw over your hands. And so I'm over there running around like this with my hands up. And they say, it looks like Godzilla. And so they call me Godzilla after that for about the next three years of college football. These friends, if I met these guys today, they would know these things about me. Friends know all about each other. But here's the thing. They don't know everything. <laughs> God knows everything about you and I. Now, there was a time they know the, the, the deep things. God knows what friends don't know. God knows things that we don't want our friends to know. <laughs> he sees the in as well as the outside. Remember in 1 Samuel chapter 16, they're looking for a king. Well, wait a minute, Israel already has a king. Who's the king that God didn't choose but the nation of Israel chose? The first king of Israel. Anybody know his name? Begins with an S. Saul, a very popular Jewish name. Well, King Saul looked like a king because he was very tall. Remember they said he was head and shoulders above all the men in Israel? And so when you think of somebody, ever hear when they run into the elections, you know, to say, he looks presidential. I mean, he's a jerk. We don't agree with anything he says, but he looks good. And they put him up there, and he blah, 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 and it sounds good. Uh, Bill Clinton was one of those. Yes, I said it, all right? Uh, he had a good line. He talked very well, a good speaker. But could I agree with anything that Bill Clinton did? Almost nothing did I agree with. But he, he, he looked, and we learned all about the things that he did. And, of course, God knew his heart. Well, Saul was a king that was head and shoulders that we would say, well, I'm really proud of my king. He, he looks like a king, but his heart was not in it. And so he went out. Remember, they were going to kill. God said, I want you to kill the people in the land so the nation of Israel can take over the land, the Amalekites, one of the tribes that were there. He didn't do it. He brought back uh, livestock and different things. And when he came back, 
the prophet, the preacher says to him, I thought you were supposed to do what God told you to do. You know what he said? I did. did exactly what God said. Uh, how come I hear the sheep going, ah, uh, what, what was, where are they from? Oh, here's what he said. He got all religious all of a sudden, King Saul. I brought those to sacrifice to God. When anybody says God like that, God, you better run as far as you can away from them. He said he was trying to uh, justify his disobedience. And what did the prophet say to him? Disobedience, King Saul, is like the sin of witchcraft, he said. And because of that, since that time, God says, because you did that, I'm going to take the kingship away from you. And there was another king. Saul was still in that position, but in God's eyes, he was no longer the king. Who's the next king of Israel? Man after God's own heart. David. But David's not the king yet in that position on the throne. And so the prophet goes, and he's looking for the next king. He's led to the house of a man named Jesse, remember? Jesse has how many sons? Anybody remember? Seven, right. And so usually in most homes, the firstborn son is like, is like the leader of the rest of the children, right? The, the, the firstborn, the oldest one, maybe a woman, but most likely if it's a guy, he's, he's the one. He's the next in line. He's the heir apparent. And so it says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, Verse 7, he, he starts, Jesse starts bringing out his kids. He said, God told me I'm here to pick and anoint the next king of Israel. He's thinking, it must be my number one son. He brings him out, and everybody's like, there he is. You know what the prophet said? Nope, <laughs> it's not him. Okay, all right, maybe number two, three, four, five, six. They go through all of them. None of them. So what does he do? Well, wait a minute. I have another son. I don't think it would be him. It's the youngest one. He's out. He's a shepherd. He's with the sheep. Look what God said about the first son in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. Surely the Lord's anointed is here. And the Lord said to Samuel, look not on his countenance, on his stature or his height, because I have refused him. This is son number one, Jesse. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth. For man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Amen. And so they went out. They finally brought David in, and it says there, I think it was verse 22. He said, verse 12, I'm sorry. Arise, anoint him, David, for this is he. God sees what your friends can't see. God, in this example here of King David, eventually anointed as king. Guess what Saul thought when they, he found out about David? Tried to kill him. He tried to do a little javelin practice and uh, javelin him to the back wall. Number one, your friends may see and know a lot about you, but God knows what? Everything. Amen? He knows everything about us. And God sees the heart, and that's more important. Number two, some people say this saying, number two, a true friend is forever. BFF. <laughs> a friend, do you ever have a good friend and, and something happened? You say, what happened? You had a little disagreement. And you that used to see your friend maybe weekly, you went out for a, I don't know, a lunch once a week, you would talk on the phone, a text. But because of this disagreement, guess what? He's not your BFF anymore. <laughs> well, maybe in your mind you remember the good times you had, but there's something changed about the relationship. What about a friend that moves away? I remember when I was a kid, we lived in Jersey City, the armpit of New Jersey, and uh, my parents said, we're buying a house in Woodridge. And Woodridge was like only 20 minutes away, west, but it's in the suburbs. And it was like we were moving to a nicer area, you know, uh, Woodridge. All my friends that I went to school with, I graduated, you know, eighth grade, Catholic school, altar boy. I was like a saint. <laughs> all my friends were gone. Did you ever move any of you kids back there? You ever move, your parents move to a new, it's a very traumatic thing for a young person. I have, still haven't gotten over it, but uh, we moved to Woodridge. I went and played football, and guess what? I had new friends. When I went from Woodridge High School, went to Jersey City, back to the rat-infested Jersey City to go to college. Uh, guess what? My friends in Woodridge all went on to college, different places. You say, I'm never going to see my best friends anymore. Uh, when you went to college, I have new friends. And I went, graduated from college. I had a bachelor's in biology. Uh, I decided, because of an injury, to become a chiropractor. 
A doctor told me I had biology, I had science, I had the labs, you have everything you need, prerequisites. School was in Long Island. I said, now I'm leaving all my friends in college. My football coach wanted me to stay on and continue to play. I said, look, I have what I need. No need for me to continue on. With this, I'm heading to what I want to do in life. I went to Long Island every day from New Jersey through New York City to Manhattan for four years. Guess what? I had new friends there. <laughs> Graduated from there. A doctor. Went to practice. Got my license. Passed all my boards. All my friends gone. They went all over the, the mainland, all over the world to practice and build their businesses and help people physically. I had new friends. I moved to Florida, a little town called Port Salerno. That's where I got saved. I went to an independent fundamental church there, made new friends. And this is how life goes. But friends are truly not forever in the sense that you're going to spend the same time you did as you when you were in grammar school, high school, college, whatever. But the thing about God is, his friendship is forever. It's forever. You know why? Because he says in his word, he will never leave us or forsake us. Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, chapter 31, verse 6, says, be strong and have a good courage, like he told Joshua, remember, over and over, fear not, nor be afraid, for the Lord thy God, he it is that go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. What a promise from God's word. A friend that sticks closer than a brother. Who? Your best friend from high school? No. God. Uh, Joshua chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, Moses was dead now. Joshua was young and the new leader of these hundreds of thousands of, of Jews that are griping all the time. And God says, don't worry, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of, of your life, Joshua. Just like I was with Moses. And he remembered that because he was with Moses too. He said, I'll be with you as well. What a promise. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee, Joshua. Of course, Joshua went in. They went to the promised land. He led one of the greatest military campaigns in the history of the world as the nation of Israel took over the promised land. Not only will God never leave you or forsake you, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things you have. And then he says, Here's one thing you have, you're never going to lose. Me, God says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Be content. Remember in Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39, Paul wrote this in Romans, a letter to the church in Rome. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril? I'm thinking of the people in the Bahamas. Did God give up on them? Is, is God does, don't love them? No. It doesn't matter, Paul said, whether you're in tribulation, distress, famine, peril, or the sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And then he says, no. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Paul says, I'm persuaded neither death nor life, nor angels, principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. In other words, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can't say that about your human friends. You may have really good friends, but a friend that will die for you, that has died for you, that wants you to have eternal life, Nothing can separate you from the love of God. You may say, I'm mad at you, God, for what you let happen to me. I'm mad. I hate you. Do you ever feel that way? You know what God says? I still love you. I still love you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. And third, he lives in you. If you're a Christian today, you say, I've been a Christian. I've trusted Christ. I've prayed. At one point in my life, I received Christ by faith. I've been born again. The Holy Spirit lives in your body temple. God is with you 24-7. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 said, Paul said to the church there, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? Ye are not your own. Remember, you've been bought with a price. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12 through 14. Paul wrote that too, a letter to the church at Ephesus. He said that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom he also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, you know, faith comes by hearing, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, then he said this, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. It's like our down payment. We have the Holy Spirit 
and then it's a down payment to what we're going to have for all of eternity, God's presence, forever, and to the praise of His glory. Aren't you glad you're saved this morning if you trusted Christ? A friend that sticks closer than a brother? Saying number three, you've heard this, blood is thicker than water. <laughs> the fact is our blood relatives, our family, should love each other. I, I, I don't know how many stories I've told Terry. Because Terry, again, we're here in Hawaii. I was born and raised in New Jersey. And I want to let her know about my family, good and bad. <laughs> and so I'll have some, oh, Terry, wait till you hear the story about my uncle. You know, this guy here, we had a party. I ended up with a big fight. So-and-so did this. And that, you know, it was like, to me, it was funny. At the time, it wasn't funny. But we tell these stories about our families and things that happen through life. And so blood is thicker than water. Mm-hmm. Now, our relatives should love each other, but it's not always the case. You ever try to plan a wedding, and uh, you're making the list, you know, the guest list, and then you have to make a list of who's sitting with who. Now, for most people, all right, we have 10 tables, 10 people at a table, that's 100 people. All right, you, got, you can invite 50 of your family and friends, I got 50 of mine, and here we go. Now, where are we going to put them? Wait! We can't put Aunt Susie with Aunt Tilly here. Why? They haven't talked for 10 years. Well, what do you mean? Well, they had a fight about 10 years ago over the uh, color of the living room. I mean, you know, something usually stupid, but they're not talking. And so we have to move around people because people's uh, families, uh, somebody died and they had a big fight over the inheritance. You ever hear that happen? Yeah, like every day. And now they're not talking since grandpa died. So what do you have to do? Well, we can't invite them. We're having Christmas. We, we can invite this one, but we can't invite that one, or if we do invite that one, and we can't invite, we had a story recently, right? About somebody had something and they invited the ex-wife or something. Oh, they had a big, big problem with that. Blood is thicker than water. Well, here it is. God's friendship is this way. His love and his friendship is stronger than any tie that you can have on this earth, family or other. All right, here's the thing. When you are saved, when you pray and receive Christ, guess what? You're born into God's family, his family, different than the human family. Thank the Lord, right? Just like I was born uh, 20 plus uh, 44 years ago, <laughs> I was born. When I have a birthday, whose birthday was it today? Uh, Patty, Patty Lou. It's her birthday. Tell her happy birthday. We love her. So I'm going to make believe Patty's 60 years old. She probably loved me for that. But I used to say, if I was 60, I'm celebrating the 40th anniversary of my 20th birthday. You know what I mean? Figure that one out. Blood is thicker than water. When you're saved, I'm not in the Cuso family. I'm in God's family. Better. Best. <laughs> John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13 says, but as many as received him, talking about Jesus, receiving him as your Savior, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood. It's not like the family relationship, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You're God's child when you trust him. If you're here this morning, you say, I come to church, I'm a religious person, I have a lot of faith in what? Your, the object of your faith has to be Christ. If you're truly born again and spiritually born, you must go the Bible way. You must go, we say, the Jesus way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He said that. And when we talk about Jesus, the only way, people, lost people especially, oh, very offended by that. This is like an exclusive club here or something. No, it's the only way to get to heaven is the Jesus way. He said it. He's God, and that's the way it is. It's simple. It's very easy. Ah, blood is thicker than water. I know that. But this is the best family, amen? You have a good family? Yes, we have a lot of good things. But you know what? If Terry could stand up and probably recite the stories I told her about all, then we laugh at it now. But these are, these are real things that happen of people that cursed and fought and, and did terrible things to each other because of whatever reason, jealousy, money, regardless, that will never happen in the spiritual family. Amen? Never! Big difference. Big difference. Second, you become regened. You know the word regenerated means you're regened. It's like your whole new creature has been made, even though it's spiritual. 
right? As many as received him again, John 1, 12, he gave them the power. There's a miraculous transformation. It's spiritual that happens when a person trusts Christ. You're born into God's family. You're no longer just uh, Frank Cuso, the human being. <laughs> you are still that, but now you have a whole new nature, 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man is in Christ, they're a new creature. All things are passed away. All things have become new. The best family, amen? Third, you're adopted. You're adopted. You're born into the family. If that's not enough, Romans chapter 8, verse 14 through 17. Paul says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. He says, you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we can cry out, Daddy, I says, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If you're here this morning, you've trusted Christ, you know it. Your inner spirit uh, relates to God's Holy Spirit. You know you're children of God. And if children, he says, this is even better, then you're heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Everything Jesus has, we are going to have. Not that we deserve it, but because of the love of God. If so, be that we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. No matter what happens in this earth, and Christians, maybe not in America, but in other parts of the world, are suffering for their faith and have suffered. And martyrology, you could study it, of the saints throughout the, the generations that have been persecuted by religious people. Jesus was persecuted more by the religious Jews than by the lost people. But he says, you're going to also be glorified with me in heaven. Abba, Father, Daddy, my heavenly Papa, Aren't you glad you're saved this morning? You have a family? I have a great family. You have an even better family with the family of God. Number four, we've got to move here because I went over the time. A friend in need is a friend indeed. You've heard of that, right? That's a human saying. Sometimes friends do fail us, though, as we already said. Uh, maybe you have a need and you go to your friend and it just he can't meet the need. Because why? Because of human uh, inability. Maybe because of a lack of his own uh, financial. Maybe you need money. I, I need $20,000, and I know this friend has it, and can you please, I'll pay you back with interest. And he says, I can't. And maybe he can't, because he's a human friend. He's limited in what he can do. God's friendship, however, unlimited. Amen? And he's available for every need, no matter what it is. That doesn't mean you go to God like a heavenly Santa Claus. All right. Oh. Pastor Cuso, 20,000. Matter of fact, that's exactly what I need today, right? And you say, Pastor Cuso said, you're my friend. All I got to do is ask. Well, don't take me uh, that uh, literal, please, all right? God's promise is to be with us in prosperity. And I'm not talking about just financial prosperity. If you're alive today, guess what? You have prosperity. You're breathing. Amen? But he's with us even as Psalm 23 says, in the valley of the shadow of death, in the highs, in the mountaintops of life, and in the valleys of life. And you know what? God knows your need, the Bible says, even before you ask him. <laughs> Isaiah 65, 24. I know people say, where's that, Pastor? Isaiah 65, 24. He said, it shall come to pass that before they call, God said, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. What a God we serve. We say, well, why do I even have to pray then? I'm just going to think really hard. God's going to know, and he does know your thoughts. The devil doesn't. But God wants you to pray. He wants to see you get down and bow and, and ask him and, and ask for... He, he delights in helping us. He wants us to come to him. Matthew 6, 31 and 32, Jesus was speaking here, of course, and people were wondering and worried and perplexed and full of anxiety he says, take no thought, no worry, in other words, what we shall eat and what we shall drink or wherewithal we shall be clothed. After this do the Gentiles seek. He says, your heavenly Father knoweth you have need of all these things. He knows your need, and here's the thing, and he can meet that need if he so chooses. Can your friends do that? Some. I doubt all of them can. <laughs> a friend in need is a friend indeed. I want to have my Heavenly Father as my best friend. Amen. And last point, friends are really this, someone said, likes that attract likes. <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes we're from the same. I always say, Terry, did you know this guy here? Italian. <laughs> you know, I'm proud of my heritage. <laughs> 
Uh, Al Capone was also Italian, she'll say maybe, <laughs> and he was a murderer, I, I know. But we, we hang around with people maybe that speak New Yorkese, you know? Our brother House from Philadelphia, that, that's close enough for me. So <laughs> but if I, I'll meet somebody, brother Jeff. I used to go shopping and uh, when I lived in New Jersey. There are areas in New Jersey where the people even among the ones that speak kind of like me and say water, coffee, chocolate, all that sausage. There are even different accents on those words. And I can tell by how a person says it, like what street they live on. I'm serious. I was in a store once in Bergen Line Avenue. Nobody speaks English there at all, but the one girl was speaking English that was taking our money. I said, you live in the Heights section of Jersey City, don't you? How did you know that? She said, I said, the way you said this word. I do, I live on blah, 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 Avenue. And I said, I, my wife was like, mm, I'm very impressed. But we usually like to be around those people. Like, uh, Terry talks. Uh, English. She doesn't know Filipino, maybe some words. She sings Hawaiian songs. I love that. But she speaks this thing they have here. Brother Kenny knows what it is. It's pigeon, they call it. <laughs> and, and so when she's with her sister or brother, or like Brother Charles hires, you know, and they, she starts talking, and I'm like sitting there, oh, here she goes. <laughs> and it's like, but she enjoys that. Just like I would enjoy if she said sausage. She, she won't say it just to satisfy me. And so... <laughs> But it's, it's just something like, it does attract like, but here's the thing. Everything we said about the human relationship, God's was better. But here's the thing. How could we be attracted with God when we, before we were saved, sinners? We were enemies with God. Though we were originally made in God's image, man, Adam and Eve were made in God's image and likeness. Because Adam fell and Eve sinned, that made us sinners. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. Thankfully for him. And when someday we get to heaven, I'm going to take Adam. Bang, zoom, like Jackie Gleason says, right? All were made sinners. Death passed upon all men because of what Adam and Eve did. But in spite of that, in spite of God and the Bible saying we were sinners, we're enemies with God, the devil is our father. Your father, the devil, right? Romans chapter 5, 8 says this, though. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is a great love. John 15, 13, we read in the beginning of the message tonight. Greater love this morning hath no man than this. What? That a man lay down his life for his friends. He proved his love. He proved his love. On this world, we may have to try to prove our love. No matter, sometimes no matter what you do for somebody, it's never enough. Do you love me? Yeah. <laughs> How do you show your love? I always think of that Broadway show, right? Don't talk of love. Da -da -da -da. Show me, right? I could bring Terry flowers. She likes that. I used to send her from New Jersey flowers from a local florist in Mililani. When she got home from school, I'd be in New Jersey late at night. 10 o'clock, waiting for the call to say, oh, oh, I got the flowers, honey, thank you so much. You know, it was a nice thing, and, and I felt good that she recognized that. But hey, hey listen, the flat, once you get married, you can give your wife flowers every day. You better not just say you love her, you better show her by the things you do and how you treat her that you love her, amen? God did that. <laughs> he showed his love in the biggest way possible. He became a man, left heaven's glory, put on this robe of human flesh, sinful flesh, but yet without sin, was tempted in all ways like you are, without sin, died on the cross. Why? For God so loved the world. There is no friend like that, John 15. Greater love hath no man than this. No man, it says. Say, my dad loved me. I know he did. I, your mother loves you. I know she loves you, but greater love has no man than this. What? What love is that? That a man laid down his life for his friends. That's true True friends, and then we're going to have friend day. We're going to have a great time. I hope we have 75. That's the number I have put in my head. <laughs> I hope you pray for whatever, that we have a good group that day. But we want to see people, we want to see people experience this friendship. What? That a man laid down his life. We want them to become friends with God through Christ, to actually become children of God through Christ. Amen. Unbelievable. You know, there's been songs, there's poems, song about the love of God. You know, the great song, the love of God is greater far, right? 
than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest stars, reaches to the lowest hell. What a love! No matter what songs, no matter how many books are written, until you taste yourself the love of God by salvation, you'll never experience it. You can enjoy these songs, you can think and write poems and, and, and sit there and read these things and be blessed by them, but you'll never be as blessed by it until you experience God's grace by being saved, becoming a child of God. A friend that sticks closer, yes, than a brother. If you're here this morning, you never experienced that love of God by trusting Christ, becoming a child of God. We want you to know that. We want you to, to trust Christ. After the service, seek me out, one of our men, one of our elders. If you're a woman, one of our ladies. We'd love to share the gospel, the story of the love of God through Christ with you. But we're going to sing in a minute. Think, be thinking in your mind about people that you know. They're nice people, maybe great friends, but they're not saved. Those are the people you want to invite on the 29th. And let's, let's think about this great love that God had, a, a friend, the best friend, the true BFF that sticks closer than a brother. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this group here today of faithful people. Help us, Lord, to have a great time these next three weeks inviting and thinking about people we could invite that will hear the gospel and maybe, Lord, that, that faith comes by hearing, that their heart will be opened and soft to the seed of the word and they will trust Christ. That's our wish, Lord, and that's your hope as well. Bless this time now as we sing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, Brother John.